Hello and welcome. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm Peter and today I'm going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of Australopithecus afarensis. Specifically, I want to focus on some casts that I recently received from the Museum of Prehistory in Totevel, France. Uh, these were beautifully done casts and I want to show you some of the specific anatomical features of Australopithecus afarensis. This material all comes from a locality called Hadar in the Afar region of Ethiopia. Here is AL400-1A. This is a beautifully preserved Australopithecus afarensis mandible and allows us to know more about the dental morphology. One of the most striking features of the dental morphology is these giant molars here. And this isn't unique specifically to Australopithecus afarensis, but to the Australopithecines and even members of the genus Paranthropus all had this feature. When we compare a modern human jaw there, a mandible on the right, what you'll see is that the molars are much smaller. Even though Australopithecus afarensis had a smaller body size than modern humans, they had much, much larger molars. And as you can see, they are very flattened. This indicates that Australopithecus afarensis was a vegetarian, mainly. It was using its large molars to grind down plant matter. This is AL200-1, a complete Australopithecus afarensis maxilla. The maxilla is the top row of your teeth that's connected to your skull. One fascinating feature of this maxilla is the canine diastema, a small gap in between the canine tooth and the incisor. And you can see that this feature is seen on both sides. In between the canine and the incisor, there is a small gap. Let me show you a chimpanzee maxilla for comparison. Here on the right is a chimpanzee maxilla. And as you can see, they too have a canine diastema, a gap in between their gigantic protruding canine tooth and their incisor. But what you will see is that that feature is much more pronounced in chimpanzees, and this is because they have such large canine teeth. So why exactly is the canine diastema important? Well, in creatures like chimpanzees who have gigantic protruding canine teeth, their teeth are so large that they don't really fit in the jaw, and thus they project forward. And when a chimpanzee closes its jaw, what happens is that the teeth rub against each other, and they slide into kind of an interlocking position, where there's a groove in between the teeth so that they fit into and overlap with the opposite jaw. And so what happens here is that the maxillary canine goes in between the premolar and the mandibular canine, and the mandibular canine goes in between the maxillary canine and the incisor, just like that. And so they fit together neatly. Now, Australopithecus afarensis didn't have giant projecting canine teeth like a chimpanzee, but its teeth were somewhat more pronounced even than in humans. And this means that they needed a little bit of a diastema, a little gap there, for the teeth to occlude. Now, part of this is that Australopithecines probably had somewhat significant sexual dimorphism. That is, males would have had more pronounced canine teeth than females, and thus the presence of a canine diastema and more pronounced canine teeth may alert us to exactly which individuals are males and which are females. This is AL129-1, a famous distal femur and proximal tibia that belong to a single individual. We can glean a number of important traits off of these bones. Let's begin by looking at the distal femur. Perhaps the most distinctive feature of this femur is the high bicondylar angle. When we look at it, we see that the shaft is really angled towards the left there. On the right is a human femur, and what we see is that they too show an angling, but in fact it is not ex as extreme as the angling seen in Australopithecines like this one. Australopithecines have a much greater angling to their femur. Here is a chimpanzee femur, and as you can see the shaft is essentially straight and goes straight up and straight down. There isn't any angling to speak of here. Before I move on from the bicondylar angle, I wanted to address one thing that I often hear people, usually creationists, bring up. 
Such people don't think that the bicondylar angle actually denotes bipedalism. And as a result, they try to bring up the example of orangutans, who have a small angle of about 5 degrees, roughly. However, there are actually different processes of growth which produce the bicondylar angle in modern humans than those that produce such a feature in orangutans. In orangutans, that feature is simply a result of the growth in height of the medial epicondyle. So basically, the condyle on the orangutan grows in height and thus it pushes it on an angle, the, the femur shaft on an angle. That's different from a human. In a human, you can actually remove the condyles off of the bottom of the shaft and you will still see that the actual shaft itself is angled. And so this is a bit of a different process and allows us to distinguish between creatures who are truly adapted to bipedalism and those that simply have a similar feature as a result of a different developmental process. This is the AL129-1 proximal tibia. One interesting feature of this is the width of the tibial plateau. This top region of the tibia is called the tibial plateau because it's very wide atop the shaft. And what we can see when we compare that to a human tibia is that Australopithecines had a much wider tibial plateau in terms of proportions to the width of the shaft. And this is a feature which is also seen in chimpanzees. Chimpanzees have a very wide tibial plateau and a narrow shaft. Here is AL333-W56. This is another distal femur and once again shows the high bicondylar angle. Another feature which I'm interested in is the shape of the femoral condyles in a lateral view. As you can see here, this uh, elliptical area down here is the shape of the femoral condyle. So let's bring in our modern human femur. And what we can see is that both modern humans and Australopithecus afarensis have very elliptical condyles. They're not round, they're elongated from side to side there. Chimpanzees have a very round femoral condyle compared to the elliptical shape seen in Australopithecines and in humans. Another interesting feature is the shape of the outline in between the femoral condyles in an inferior view. So basically what we're doing right now is looking straight up the shaft of the femur so that we can see in between the condyles here on the bottom. And what we'll note here is that Australopithecines have kind of this rounded shape of the femoral condyle. When we compare the intercondylar shape of afarensis to a modern human, what we see is that modern humans have a much more kind of pointy outline. On the left there you can see that the modern human outline narrows whereas the Australopithecine one is more rounded and doesn't really project upwards on either side. In fact, this feature is more similar to the condition seen in chimpanzees like this one, who have an outline which is basically of equal heights on both the medial and lateral sides, similar once again to the Australopithecine. This is AL333-3, a beautifully preserved proximal femur once again from Australopithecus afarensis. When we compare this to a modern human, one thing that we can note is that Australopithecines have a long femoral neck. The femoral neck is this region in between the head and the trochanters, basically. And when you look at them, basically what you can see is that modern humans have a shorter neck. This is a feature which is also seen in chimpanzees like the one on the right. They have a long femoral neck. I hope you enjoyed this little look at some of the anatomical features of these bones. If you do enjoy this channel, please make sure to like and subscribe. Thank you.